that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. And you've told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love? and watch me rise again. Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you've told me who I am. I am yours, not because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you've told me who I am. I am yours, I am yours. All right, <clears throat> in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So the last talk, um, is the last part of the, the verse that we had, um, which was, my grace is sufficient for you because my, my might is, is made known through, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So, <clears throat> for this last one, and forgive me if it's boring, I just wanna look at different stories of biblical characters of saints because I can't tell you how God does it, right? So we can, we can, we can look at places where he, where he did it um, as opposed to trying to, exp to explain how he does it because there's not really an explanation for it, but to just see how it all kind of comes together. Because it's one thing for God to give help, right? And it's another thing to say that his, his strength or his might is made perfect 
um, and weakness. So I just want to illustrate the, this, this God working through the small aspect because it's, it's when you work through the, what we're talking about in, in talk one, the incapacitated, when it doesn't make sense is where you see the power of something, right? Where it's the, the, the against all odds type stories, right? So if we look through biblical history, we can see that God always has a tendency of working through the weak, right? Working through the small or working through the, the incapacitated. Um, so I'm choosing random examples, but you have Samuel, right? So Samuel is literally some kid whose parents said to the temple, you can have him, right? And so, I mean, it wasn't malicious, but like, he didn't, he didn't choose to be there, right? It's not like this great child of God went into the temple and said, I will do it, Lord, right? It, he, it just it happened to him, right? Um, and it was not the priest that was hearing God. It was Samuel, right? And it was, it was the person not expected. It's the little kid. So he's hearing the voice of God, right? And it's like, who is this? Um, and, and he has no idea who it is, right? Like that, which made it, again, even more compelling because it's not like he was just like, guess what, Eli? Like, God spoke to me. It was like, Eli, are you calling me? Um, but this, this young kid, it, it sucks for Eli, but the first thing he prophesied was that Eli was going to die. Um, but it was the same guy that would be crowning kings, Right, that this, this small kid is the one that God would be using as, as that vessel to crown kings to prophesy. Um, Gideon, right? Gideon was a scrawny little kid. How many of you guys have seen the movie 300? Um, no one? Okay, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, the, the real story of 300 is in the Bible, right? That this was like some scrawny little kid, I mean, 300, the movie, everybody had a six pack. Gideon like was nothing. Um, and he was being called upon to lead an army against the Philistines, right? And Gideon was like, are you, are you joking? And it wasn't just Gideon who was like, are you kidding? When Gideon told the people, yeah, God asked me to do this, they're like, are you kidding? Um, there's no way it's, it's Gideon, right? And not just that, it was like the way that God did it right, with the army, was that he was just like, okay, um, take the down, he's like, this is too many people to fight the Philistines, right, they had thousands originally, and he's like, go down to the bank of the water, and whoever laps the water like a dog, whoever drinks in a, like, a, a, the least civilized manner, <laughs> that's who I want, right, and it was reduced to 300, right, against thousands, and it was, and it was a victory, right, what I'm trying to get at is that they were in a position of weakness, right? They were in a position of incapacity, right? And the reason for it was actually because they had messed up. So even, even part of their situation was partially because of their mistakes, right? But that God's movement, his desire is to deliver, right? It is to save. And that in fact, God's might, my strength is made known in weakness or is perfected in weakness was shown by the mere factor that on a human level, it made no sense, right? By anyone's human calculations, they should not have had victory, but they did. Joseph, a biblical character that I have a love-hate relationship with, um, because Joseph, Joseph being sold in slavery in Egypt was really mean of his brothers. <laughs> But he was a bit of a jerk um, to his brothers too, right? And, and, and maybe he wasn't. And I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying that out loud. Um, but the guy is coming to his brothers. He's spoiled rotten by his dad, right? The guy doesn't lift a finger to work, right? His brothers are doing all the work. Um, and all that Joseph did was be the firstborn of Rachel, right? That, that's all he did, right? He didn't do it, right? And so his father would send him to inspect his brother's work in the fields, and he'd come with his luxurious coat. Um, younger brothers are younger brothers. Um, mine's in Abuna now, so I have to be careful. Um, and so 
he messed up. Okay, like like he told his brothers, I have this dream. Like you guys are all worshiping me, right? You're bowing down to me, and it was like we're not that interested. And actually, it was one of the few times where I think the only time I'm aware of in in the story of Joseph, where actually even his dad was like, "Belashahabibi," right? Like this one, like I think you should stop talking. But he didn't, right? The next day, it was like, "I happened again," right? This time you're worshiping me as this. Um, and so he messed up, but his pursuit of doing right, right, is why God didn't abandon him, right? Even, even if part of the reason for his situation was because of his error, right? It wasn't, God wasn't like, well, I mean, bro, you asked for it, right? Look, look how you dealt with your brothers. It was like, no, I'm, I'm still with you, right? I'll, I'll go with you. Right? And so as a result of him pursuing right, you've got a Hebrew in the land of the Egyptians, which is not a thing. Like they don't like, they hated Hebrews, right? Um, as we see with what happens with Joseph's kids. Um, like they become slaves, right, in the land of Egypt. But Joseph doesn't stop pursuing righteousness, right? He chooses virtue in the face of temptation. Right, where he, 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 Potiphar's wife, that's not an easy person to say no to, right? There was no written law for the Jews at the time about adultery, about all those things. Like, he could have just been like, oh, I'll just do as the Egyptians. Just live and let live. That's how they do it here, right? And he didn't, right? And, and it's almost like God was letting it hit rock bottom to manifest his might in the weakness because, because, of, again, this synergy that we we're talking about, Joseph's willingness to work with God, right? Because at any point he could have been like, bun this, like, you do you, right? I'm not going to jail for you, right? I'm not doing that. Um, but he goes to jail, and even in jail, he felt abandoned, right? Because even when he's got this gift of interpreting dreams, and who'd have thunk that that's what would spring him from prison, Right, like that's, that's not anybody would think like, oh, maybe I'll get out of prison because I can interpret dreams. It seems like the most random gift, right, to receive, this grace that he received. But it's what lands him eventually this seat with Pharaoh, right, of saying that Pharaoh, that God is, God is working through this, this small guy, right? God is working through this incapacitated. He's, he's a stranger in the land of Egypt. He's a nobody. He's to be spat upon in this great civilization. And of all places, he's in jail, right? And that it's from jail, right? That Pharaoh's like, I have these dreams and I don't know. I'm, I want he's going to interpret it. And his priests can't. And so he's like, does anybody, I, and, and he's throwing a, a tantrum Right, he's like, I, I cannot live like this. I need someone to interpret my dreams. And then finally, right, in comes the, uh, was it the butler or the baker who lived? Um, I think the, ba is it the baker who lives? No, that's the one that they eat it. No, the butler lives. He'll buttle as he did before. Um, so he, as he's buttling, um, he's like, actually, I know a guy. <laughs> um, I've got a dream guy, right, which is so random. Right? And who is the one who tells the Pharaoh? The butler. Right? Like, it's not the wise sage counselor beside him. It's the butler. And he's like, actually, Pharaoh, if I can have your ear, I know a guy. Remember when you were going to kill me? Like, he, he is the one who told me that you weren't. Right? And Joseph goes from prison to the foreigner acting as number two in the land of Egypt. Right? Like, that's, that's bizarre. Right? And then the guy who is delivered in slavery to Egypt redeems his family. Right? He, Egypt becomes the place that was his place of exile. It becomes the refuge for his family. Right? This is God manifesting his might through weakness. Right? Of saying, no, no, no. Bring me the most minuscule people bring me the dumbest situations because then you won't have a doubt about who's doing it right if joseph was the one that was like incredible speaker with this great political prowess right people would be like no no no, he was just savvy 
right? But when it's through something that small, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense logically. But again, God's help with our weakness for those willing to work together. At any point along the way, Joseph could have said no. And that was it, right? Joseph had the option of no so many points along the way, right? And God also could have said, well, you messed up. I'm not dealing with you. And he did not do that, right? That, it's, this, it's this synergy that's constantly going. King David, as we talked about in the beginning, right? As now we can see it. King David was a man of great weakness, man of great weakness. He had physical prowess in the war, right? But he, as a kid, was scrawny. He was chosen when he was scrawny. He was chosen when he was a nobody. And he became a somebody. God's grace made him a somebody, right? But then when he started to mess up as a somebody, and not just any somebody, I don't think people get the, the, the magnitude of what it meant to be a king. This is like, in modern language, like being a bishop, right? He was, he, was, he was chosen, he was anointed. He had a laying on of hands from Samuel, right? This is a big deal. And part of his role as king was also to rightly divide the word of God, right? So this is, this is who he is. And that's who, we make a big deal that he slept with Bathsheba, and that is a big deal. But it's almost like we forget that he also murdered her husband, <laughs> Right? It wasn't just that he slept with her. He had her husband killed. Right? He plotted and planned for his death, and not just any death, like put him in the front lines, get him done quickly. Right? To the point that even when Samuel comes, um, uh, Nathan comes to him, right? And, and, and David's acting all righteous, and he's like, let me tell you a story. Right? And tells him what he did, and he's like, that guy needs to die. Right? Like David, by his own judgment, right, was like, that guy's worthy of death. And Nathan's like, yeah, so that's you. Right? And he's like, oh. But again, God knew the heart of David, the willingness of David, and, and God's like, no, I'm not doing that to you. I'm not even judging you by your standards. You're right. Like, that's the right penalty, but I'm not doing that. Right? I'm working with you. Right? And from, from David, the scrawny little kid, was the glory at its height. There was never a king before or after David like David. There's none, right? They're like, the good King Hezekiah was good, but none is like David, right? And so this, is, this was the most unexpected of unexpected. And if you understand even the situation of the Israelites, like if you know what the nation of Israel was geographically, there's only this tiny, fertile, itty-bitty piece in that strip where they can grow stuff. The rest is desert. Nobody liked that land, right? That's why no one took it, right? It wasn't favored. The only thing important about that piece of land was that it bridged it to Mesopotamia and the Eastern Kingdoms, right? It was, it, was, it, was, it was strategic in war to own it, and that's why the Israelites got wrecked time and time and time and time again, right? No one is interested in Israel. They're interested in this land. Right? There's nothing good about the land. But God took that and made it something so that people would be like, how on earth did this tiny thing become a big deal? Because it's not by anything they did. Right? It's, again, it's this cooperation. Because what I can't teach is God's might. God's might can just be seen right? as, 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 as snippets. But you can't teach God's might. You can't give a lecture on, here's how might looks like. Right? It's just, it doesn't make sense. The apostles. Forgive me, wall of fame. They're really dumb. Right? They were not, they were not somebodies in the people of Israel. Right? At all. I don't even know how they work together. Um, like, to have Matthew sit in your crew like, was already probably insulting to at least John and James, like, who are affiliated with the temple, right? Because a tax collector is working with the enemy. I can only people, I don't think people appreciate that, right? Is that, like, it would be literally today like a Palestinian working for the Israeli government. That's, like, nothing could be more absurdly insulting, 
right, to a, to a Palestinian. That's what Matthew did for a profession, right? I was saying, I'm collecting money for your occupiers, right? It's, it's, it's hideously offensive, right? And that's Team Jesus, right? And then you've got John and James, Peter's a fisherman, right? These are, these are and I, I, I always use this analogy, and I'm not insulting people who have these professions, I'm just trying to make a point. This isn't Wall Street, right? This is 7-Eleven, this is Petro-Canada, right? This is the bus boy, right? That's the ones who guys like, I'll use those guys, right? And we see that they're not very intelligent because like in the gospels, they themselves admittedly over and over and like, we had no idea what he was talking about, right? Like, and he said this and we were like, sure. Um, my favorite, favorite, favorite is, is Thomas. Um, like, I digress for a second, but when, <laughs> And I always use this example, I just think it's hilarious. When the Lord is having this deep, serious talk with them on his goodbye, and he's like, I am going, um, and the way you know, like, to whom I'm going, you know, and the way you know, and you will come after me, right? And you can picture, like, 11 of them just being like, and Thomas is the only one who's like, I don't know where you're going, <laughs> right? Like, he's like, what is he talking about? Um, but they don't know, right? And, 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 and it's like, they have no clue. Right? Even Thomas on another time is just like, yeah, let's all go die. I guess that's what we're doing, right? And so, and these are the same guys, right? That the minute the going gets tough, oh, they run, right? They're not like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, run, right? Only, only John has some decency. Um, no offense, again, they all died for him in the end, um, except John. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> maybe that's the reward. Um, but, um, they were nobodies, but they were cooperating with Christ. They made hard decisions. It was not an easy decision to be affiliated with Christ. It was not an easy decision, even when he was, even in his heyday, it was not, right? Because he was hated by the institution, right? And if you're hated by the institution, that's already a very, very tense place to be, right? Because you're like, like imagine today, the equivalent would be like, the synod has made it very clear that they don't like someone, right? If you're affiliated with them, it's like, am I gonna be allowed communion? Am I gonna be allowed to serve? Will I be able to keep my friends in church? Right, it's not, it's not an easy position to be in, right? You're, you're, you know you might be ostracized, right? And that's why there's this tension among the apostles because when, he's, when the Lord is being scandalous, and he was scandalous, make no mistake about it, right? Then it's just like, uh, I don't know. Judas voted with his feet. Judas wasn't just about the money, right? Judas was like, who is this guy? Like, he's letting these people, th this woman touch him like that? It's not an accident that the incident where, where Judas, it says, and then Judas went to the high priest, Judas went to the temple, was when the woman was all over him. Because like, no, no, this is the last straw. Like this is, this is socially completely unacceptable, right? Their willingness to be with him in spite of that is why their work, he counted even, even just the following of him, was a source of grace and then a manifestation of might because who was witness to the resurrection? These nobodies. Who were the ones who were hiding them but then right after it, they're going to the temple and being like, yeah, we believe, right? And then they're beat up. It said that they're beat up, right? And it says that those same guys who are petrified are like, and they, they, they rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer, right? These ones that were like, get me away from the suffering are now the ones doing that. Now, why would anyone believe them? They're nobodies. Right? I think God is working through the small to manifest his might because that is not who you would choose to tell a compelling story. Right? Can you imagine the 7-Eleven guy overturning Wall Street? But these 11 nobodies overturned the entire Roman Empire that armies fell before. They undid it. And not with a sword, 
right? Not with eloquent speech, as St. Paul says, right? Not by anything, by just the power of the message. The power of the message that Christos Anisti. Because these became eyewitnesses, right? And that's why it was like, Christ saying, oh, don't marvel about these things. You're going to do bigger miracles. When they were like, we did a miracle, God, we did a miracle. And he's like, yeah, 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 you'll do bigger, right? You'll do bigger than I did, right? Where it's just like, because it's, it's not yours. Like, it's, it's, it's not yours. That might has a, has a purpose. But because of who they were, it confused the people, right? I mean, can it, can it be? Right? But again, it's not who you expected to give that message. God is always looking for that so that nobody says because of the Alcan words. Today, like, we already have everybody attacking faith and religion more than ever, but it would have been like, no, 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 they're just, they were just good speakers. Right? They were just convincing. That was their worldview, and they knew how to speak about it very well. That would be the argument. Right? But the argument even today, 2,000 years later, can't be made. It's like, no, it wasn't their worldview. It stood against everything that was in their worldview. Right? And on top of it, they weren't very intelligent. They were just saying what they saw. Right? Of God revealing to those who are willing to be empty, to be filled, that's who God can work with. St. Athanasius, whose eve of his feast it is tonight, Athanasius was some kid, right? Like that's all he was at the beginning. Athanasius was just some kid. And there's two accounts of his origins, right? There's the history of the patriarchs actually says he was the son of a pagan, um, a pagan couple, and that his, um, his father died and his mother was really upset because he had found access to a fragment of the gospels and started reading it. And she was petrified that he would convert. And she went to a pagan priest. It was, it was actually kind of humorous to me. I'm like, they did the same things. We were like, go to Abuna. Um, go to the pagan Abuna. Can I have Abuna? Right? What can we do? My, my kid might convert. Um, and ironically, the pagan said, I don't know if there's anything you can do to stop that kid. Right? Um, whether that's the case or he's born to Christian parents, he falls in the lap of Alexander. But what did he do with his choices? He was just some kid. I don't know how many of you guys have memorized the baptismal rites. I haven't. Um, but apparently for play, he does baptisms, um, knowing the ritual inside out, um, and it catches Alexander's attention. But Athanasius didn't see himself as anybody, right? Athanasius didn't view himself as anybody. He sat at the feet of the monks, right? And that's why, of all people, it would be the monks who would, who would harbor him for most of his exile, right? But God is taking this scrawny 20-year-old to speak truth at the Council of Nicaea in front of the first universal meeting of bishops. Can you imagine being, I mean, 20 then in the eyes of the people is very different than now, but can you imagine sitting in front of hundreds of bishops saying, go, speak? Right, to argue the most divisive thing that has, that has happened upon the church and the history of her existence. Right? And then, right, at the age of 25, being made Pope. Right? That's, that's scary. Like, I'm way older than he was at the time, and I can't imagine that. Right? And to be at the mercy of Emperor of Rome who's flipped on you, right? But Athanasius' strength was not in himself. He was not the one that had capacity to stand in front of the emperor, but he did, right? There's a really cool story about Athanasius when he was um, in Constantinople, uh, in, um, actually he was near Nicaea, I think he was in Bithynia, um, and went to the emperor and grabbed his horse by the bridle and said, the Lord judge between me and you. But Athanasius wasn't being arrogant. He really meant the Lord judge between me and you, right? Where he didn't see himself as the source of authority. He said, matters of the empire leave to the princes of state. That's you, your highness. Matters of the church leave to the prince of the church. He could stand in front of an emperor and God could work through him, and why the emperor couldn't do anything to him, because God was with Athanasius. 
right? It's why, can you imagine, like, I just, I don't think you, I don't think you can, I don't think anybody can, can fathom what the situation was like. Can you imagine if every single priest you know is teaching something, every bishop you've heard of is teaching something, and only one guy is saying, you're all wrong. And we're talking about thousands of clergy, right? We're not talking about one or two. We're not talking about just the city of Ottawa. And you've got one guy being like, you're all wrong. Right? Can you imagine that? Why would you believe him? Why would you believe him? Would you not be like, these guys can't all be wrong? Right? That would be the natural impulse. And it'd be like, can we just live and let live? Like, whatever, this is a philosophical discussion, right? Leave it alone, right? Ahnal Busata were the simple, just make it practical for me, right? That would be the natural. God is working through the small, right? I'm saying, I will stand with Athanasius, exile after exile after exile. I will miraculously deliver him, and miraculously he did, right? There's a, there's a famous story where they were praying, it seems to be Tazbaha in the church, right? And, and the imperial army barges in the church to arrest him, and they were singing um, uh, Psalm 136. And it says that Athanasius walked through them, and it's as if they couldn't see him, right? As if they couldn't see him. Right? That was the protection of God saying, I, my grace is sufficient. Right? Who is Athanasius against the army of Rome? Really? Like, like literally, who is he against the army of Rome? Right? Or God's like, oh, I can, that's nothing. Rome? Like, right? And, and God, even his miracle, wasn't extravagant. Right? His extravagance could have been that in a moment all the armies of Rome fall down. Instead, it was like, no, you can't see Athanasius. That's it, right? Go, Athanasius, leave, right? Um, and his willingness to work with God, incapacitated, is the reason why nobody can argue. People today try and make the Athanasian dilemma to just be like, this was a political war that that where one viewpoint won over another, where Jesus became God at Nicaea. And it's like, actually, history is not on your side. The whole church ran after Arius. It's quite the opposite, right? The side that should have won was the Arian side, if we're going to talk that way. The side favored by emperor after emperor after emperor was the Arian side. Right? Every time he stood up for a breath of fresh air, Athanasius, he sent him right back into exile, which shows even more the power of God. Athanasius is steering the church, one man in hiding. In hiding. Right? He's not sitting from the episcopal throne. Right? He's sitting from his episcopal cell in hiding in some monastery, being going from one place to another, 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 right? But the power of God, this collaboration, is what made, I don't know if you guys know his story, if you don't, you need to read it, it's, it's, it's epic, like there needs to be like a multi-part movie about Amina Bruna, of course we're talking about that, there needs to be, like, and it still would be epic, right? Of, of what he goes through, and in the end, the end, the very, very end, he gets the, the tiniest bit of respite. But he didn't care for that, right? And that God saved the entire of Christendom through one individual, red-headed, short guy with a hooked nose, some dude from Alexandria, right? God works through the small. And it goes without saying, the lady of us all, the Theotokos. Right? God looked through all of time for someone who could cooperate with him in this way. Through all of time. Like, think about what that means. To find a woman so pure, so loving, Right? So like the image and likeness of God himself. To be able to contain within her 
the limitless. Right? That's mind blowing. Right? We we call God uncircumscript. Right? That means like you can't draw a circle around it. You cannot contain it. Right? You can't circumscribe it. And saying that the uncircumscript was contained in her. And she's mind blowing. And if you think about it, what made her like this, again, it's she was in terms of capacity, she's a nobody. Mary is a nobody. Right? She's not a noble woman. She wasn't crazy rich, loved by all the people. Right? Someone chose for her to be dedicated to the temple. That was a decision her parents made. Right? She she didn't we have no idea. There's a tradition that she said, yes, we have no idea. She was two, right? Or three, according to some traditions. She didn't vote. She was immersed in the life of the church. I mean, most of us today, just again to put this in modern life, are so angry when our parents make us go to church. Right? We're just like, leave me alone. Right? I'll go when I want. Right? This woman wasn't just forced to go to church for Ashaya. Right? It was like, you're going to live here now, Habiti. <laughs> right? How to, okay. Right? Her service in the temple is menial stuff. She's the coffee girl. Pardon me. Right? She does the, the, the menial task. Right? She's the cleaner, she's walking around, she's picking up stuff, she's cooking, she's cleaning, she's, she's, she's behind the scenes, she's not in the spotlight, and because she's not in the spotlight of men, she's very much in the spotlight of God, right? This is, this is someone with whom I can work, that's not obstructed by her own will, right? This is a different kind of person, because the Lord works best with those who have, as we talked about in the last lecture, humility of thought, lowliness in thought, right? They're not self-absorbed. The willingness to say okay to everyone without a fight, without pride, without feeling above things, right? So many people ask the question, I'm like, a Christian supposed to just say okay, and they're like, but how do I not be a pushover? And it's like, that's not even a question. I mean, the answer is very simple. You're not a pushover when you, when you chose, Right? Like, you, you, you could fight back. So you're choosing to not fight back. It already makes you not a pushover because you have the option. Right? But I don't think that was St. Mary's thought process of, I don't want to look like a pushover. She's like, if I can give it, why not? You want this? Take it. You need this? How it? You desire this? Okay. Right? Without pride, without feeling above things. And that's... Why our God who sees the hidden things rewards openly but can work through this? Because this little girl in the temple see God's might, the cooperation, grace responding to our, our nature became the mother of God and the mother of the whole world. So the little girl who is nothing became extraordinary and is now known in every nation. But it's her humility, her humility, her humility before God is why she is not even interested in things making sense, right? The angel comes and says, you're going to be with child, you're going to have God's kid. Honestly, do you, do you honestly, any, like who's heard that before, right? That never happened before and never have happened. We're just like, what does it even mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the mother of, of God, right? And, her, and, and, and all she says is like, okay, um, you, 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 you know that I'm a virgin, right? And like, he's like, yeah. I was like, okay. She didn't even ask for an explanation, right? Be it done unto me according to your will. One of the most powerful statements in the history of humanity. Be it done unto me according to your will. Yes. The yes of Mary and the yes of Christ are the two important, most important yeses in the history of, 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 of existence. Those two yeses. Right? She doesn't say that doesn't make sense. This is insane. Just let your word be done. 
whatever God says is going to happen, who am I to argue? That cooperation, right? That, that synergy. Um, she's just not full of herself, she's, nor is she thinking of the world, right? Even, even Joseph is troubled, right? Like Joseph is like, uh, you're pregnant and I'm not the father, right? And Joseph in all his righteousness, we call him Joseph the righteous, wanted to quietly, he had respect for her, quietly put her away. That meant quietly break off the engagement. I was saying this isn't going to work. Right? Because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Again, God is using the impossible to show forth the possible. Joseph wasn't wrong, but Joseph was being honest. And that's why God even had synergy with Joseph. And that's why God manifested himself to Joseph and said, it's actually true. Right? He didn't have contempt. He was respectful. And so God responded and said, don't worry, Joseph. It's actually the truth. Don't do this thing. Right? That synergy of, of Mary and Joseph with God did something. Um, she's pure. The pure in heart see God, as we said. Um, our God looks for the meek and the humble. He looks for the meek and the, and the humble. He himself was born in a manger. Right? He was born in poverty. And after being born in poverty, he immediately becomes a refugee, an immigrant. Right? He goes off to Egypt like almost right away as a refugee. Right? Um, Bethlehem, house of meat, house of bread, house of, house of food, right? again, was a nobody in the nation of Israel. Right? So even the prophet said, like, in you, Bethlehem, the least among your brethren, from you will come greatness. God is always looking for that. Right? So these juxtapositions, these oxymorons, these paradoxes are being used by our God so there can be no doubt ever that it is his work, his might. The Lord works through the small. And that's why the, the biggest example of this is in the incarnation itself, as we, as we said earlier. Right? The Lord makes himself small. The Lord makes himself small by using you, right? The Lord makes himself small by limiting himself voluntarily through us. He doesn't have to work through us, right? And he's saying, no, I, I, I'm happy to be manifested in you. This is God's humility, right? God could easily be like, no, 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 praise me. I'll do it all. You all sit back, watch this show. Ta-da, ta-da, right? And I'm like, aren't I awesome? Bow right? He does it, <laughs> right? He has never asked for that, right? When he could, he was in like, so I'm so excited that I made you. Bow, bow, quickly bow. Now tell me I'm awesome. I'm awesome, right? Right? He, he never, right? It has never happened. But he limits himself voluntarily. He gives of his own will to us as humans, right? He isn't joking. He's not joking about us being co-heirs with him. It's not an honorary title that he's pretending. He's really giving it to us to co-rule co with him. It's not a small thing that he really, truly, actually, amenly treats you as a son or daughter, right? And gives you the grace of being more than what you are by nature through his divine dwelling in you, through his adoption of you, through his gracing you, through making us his. Again, he took what is ours and gave us what is his. This is the synergy. This is the humility of God. His humility, his lowering of himself, exalts you. It raises you. Your humility is to know yourself and know that these are graces, not rights. They're graces. And when you know this, then his divine power can now work. His divinity can resurrect your humanity. His power topples empires with the flick of his hand. Only the thing is that's not what he's interested in. Right? What he's interested in is your heart, not your money. 
He's interested in your heart. He made everything. He doesn't need it. Right? We offer unto you these things from what is yours. Like, they're already mine. Right? Like, it's like you're not giving me something. He's not the one saying it. We're the ones saying to him, we offer from what is yours. Right? What are you going to offer God? Right? To use the analogy earlier of the rich dad, it's like if dad gave me all the money, if I dad, buy dad a gift, I'm actually buying him a gift from his own money. Right? But the gesture is still meaningful to him. Right? Like, of just being like, I thank you for taking it and, and trying to give me something. Right? It's, there's, there's a beauty in that. But he's happy to be in cooperation with man if man surrenders his choice, his loving, to him. He never demands it. I'm saying, will you choose with me? Will you choose me? Am I the one you want? Right? And so the question is to ask ourselves, are you small? Or are you large in your own view? And I don't mean size. Right? Are you in your own view a big deal? Is your pursuit of being a big deal? If that's your pursuit, you, you, you'll struggle seeing God. Not because you're an idiot, but because your goal is you. And a person whose goal is themselves doesn't see others. Think of anybody you know that's career oriented, that it's like, man, it's taking a toll on the family, on the marriage, on the whatever, because of their obsession. It's the same thing. Anything you pursue is going to come at the expense of other things. What are you pursuing? Do you look to be in charge of things? Because then you're not trying to be small. God likes the small. It's one thing to be made big. It's nothing to try and be big. It's one thing to be put in charge of something. Another thing to pursue being in charge of something. Do you want to be in the position of prominence? Are you looking to be seen, noticed, recognized, appreciated, valued, seen? Do you want to be the leader of whatever it is that you are doing? Do you want to dominate conversations in which you participate? Do you want your views to dominate over the views of others? Do you look to give people advice even when you're not asked? Are you trying to direct people? Do you act like you're the only one around, that you can do whatever you want? And others should simply follow, follow, shoot, follow suit. If you're those things, the patterns that we're talking about, these, these figures that we've talked about, those aren't the patterns that, the patterns that we usually see God working through. These are the patterns of tending to be more full of yourself. Forgive me. Right? And, I, and, I, and I say it to myself, I'm not just saying it to, to you. Your will, your thoughts, your opinions, your wisdom, right? And that's why it's no surprise that Paul, whose, whose verse it was that we're using in all, all of this, Paul saw that in real life. The guy that he fought against was the guy who appeared to him, right? And Paul, the expert Jew, God intentionally, I think, didn't use the, the Jewish expert. He was, he could have whooped, forgive me, apostles, any of the apostles on Judaism, right? He, he was the actual student of the famous Gamaliel. And God, instead of being like, be my, my, my missionary to the Jews because you know the Jews best, is like, no, 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 go to the Gentiles. Go to the Gentiles. Saying, no, it's not about your expertise. I'm making you go somewhere else because it's not about your mind. It's about your heart. It's about me. I'm going to work in and through you if you are willing. The Lord exalts the meek and humbles the proud. This is the Psalms. This is the Gospels. It's repeated over and over throughout the Bible. The Lord uplifts the meek and chastises the proud. The Lord rejects the proud but uplifts the fallen. Right? It's, it's a recurring theme. The Lord loves the simple, but the proud he knows from afar. Our Lord humbled himself and took the form of a servant. The one who is king by nature became a slave, became man. The bodiless took on body. The uncontainable became contained. The timeless entered time. The king became slave to all. The parent became child. And the absolute allowed himself to be obedient to others. 
this is a wonder greater than we can ever understand. And from that weakness came the greatest might. Right, what we sing in the great hymn of Great Friday, Holy God who in weakness manifested what is greater than might. Be meek, be humble, be small, that we may see his glory. To him be the majesty and power now and always, the age of all ages. Amen. Sorry, that was less interactive. My bad. Any uh, questions, comments? Any questions, guys, before we uh, wrap up this portion? Okay, so just a quick overview. Oh, sorry. Th thanks, Abuna, for the talk, but I wanted to ask, like, uh, you said there is a difference between being made big and, like, bygone. Oh, and like us trying to become big, how do we know if it's like God trying to grow us or if it's us like trying to become bigger? That's a good question. By, by, by being attentive to your motives um, and in your choices, right? Um, I'll give an, an, an embarrassing example. Um, in like first year, pharmacy school when I was in Toronto um, our church like Pope Shnu at one point was like I wanted to be a member of the board who's from the youth right and I wanted it so badly like just as, as a proof that I was a big deal among the youth right so I'd act all humble and I wasn't um, and I still remember the week before it I was ordained a reader which was a really big deal at our church and I like wept and cried and who am I Right, and meanwhile, I was like petrified that I was gonna be late to the vote because I'm like, ah, they need to see me so they can vote for me, right? And I got it, right? And then I went into confession with the Buddha and I'm like, so I kind of wanted it, like I, I did. And he goes, yeah, yeah, you were fake crying at your reader thing. I was like, well, I wasn't fake crying. Um, and he's just like, but there was, a, there was a motive there that wanted it, right? That wanted it. Now, we can struggle with the wanting it, right? But Am I trying to get attention? Am I trying to show up so that they see me, right? It's not a sin that I showed up, but it is a sin when I know that I'm showing up for that reason, right? Um, it's like what Christ said actually about if you're invited to a dinner, right? The way that things worked in those, in those times is that like the rich people were in the inner part of the house, right? And the poorer you were, the closer you were to the door, right? And Christ is saying, no, 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 don't go straight to the front because you might be told to leave because they're putting the important people in your place. So you're going to find yourself leaving, right? We're saying stay at the back. But he said, but then they might take you and put you there. He even acknowledged that, right? The difference is when I put myself there, right? So examine the motives, examine the intentions, right? Um, and then even if you're put in that position, examine your reactions, Right, like of like, all right, I, I, I didn't ask for it, I'm in it, but actually now I am becoming arrogant, right? Then maybe I should be careful. Great question. Okay, so um, if there are any questions, we'll leave them for tonight's uh, Q&A that'll be at St. Uh, Mark and St. Mary of Egypt. I'll just uh, walk you guys through the rest of the program uh, so that we're all clear on what's happening. Uh, we'll go downstairs now to the Afebi Hall. We're just going to have a quick little workshop to wrap up this portion of the discussion um, that we've had with our Father Anthony Paul. And then we'll, we'll you can stick around here. We're going to set up the volleyball nets for some activities after the workshops, and you can just hang out. The plan is that at 6 p.m. we all join together at St. Mark and St. Mary of Egypt, which is on Parkdale. So we'll be relocating there for the evening portion of this service. We'll have a meal together at 6 p.m., We'll pray Vespers together with our Father Anthony Paul, and then he'll lead us uh, through another discussion in Q&A, and then we'll wrap up uh, with the midnight praises and the homeless service. So, I think midnight praises 
will start around 8.30. Someone who's more familiar with SMSM. I see someone shaking their head, so I'm just going to assume, yeah, okay. So Midnight Praises will start around 8.30. Vespers will start around 7, I believe. And the talk will start around 7.30. I'm just saying random times. There's a poster somewhere, so don't <laughs> consider everything I said not. And then I'll, we'll look at the poster together. But the most important part is be there at 6 p.m., I guess, if you want to meet. Okay? So we'll stand for a prayer together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. O King of peace, grant us your peace, establish for us your peace, and forgive us our sins. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the blessing, and the majesty, now and forever, and unto the ages of all ages, amen. The Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. Christ, you say, O Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever, amen.